Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Angela Ferrell-Zabal, and I'm the Executive Director of Moms Demand Action. Together with Students Demand Action in Every Town for Gun Safety, we're the largest grassroots gun violence prevention organization in America. It's such a joy to be here and connect with you all, especially the young people tuning in. I say this all the time, but our students aren't the leaders of tomorrow. They're the leaders of today. And it's because they have been handed a reality where guns are the number one killer of their generation. It's unacceptable, but we don't have to accept this as the norm. This crisis is preventable, and we have the common sense, popular solutions that we know work. We've already gotten so much done together, and I have so much hope that we'll achieve a safer future because of the work that everyone on this call is doing day in and day out. On that note, I wanna take a moment to introduce the amazing folks on today's panel. We're so lucky to be joined by Congresswoman Veronica Escobar, Congressman Stephen Horsford, Christina Titsun Ramirez, the Executive Director of Next Gen America, and Natalie Fall, the Executive Director of March for Our Lives. All of you bring different experiences and expertise to the table to discuss how gun violence is impacting young people in America and what strategies we can use to actually tackle this crisis. I'm personally so excited to hear from you all. So we're gonna first hear from Christina Titsun Ramirez. Christina is a civil rights leader and a former US Senate candidate, author and community organizer, forging a better future for all Americans. Christina is the executive director of Next Gen America and previously founded and led two of Texas largest voting and civil rights organizations, that's JOLT, a Texas wide organization focused on energizing the Latino vote and Workers Defense Project, which is winning the passage of local and state laws, protecting the rights of hundreds of thousands of workers. Christina, over to you. So good to be here. Thank you, Angela. And thank you to our two congressional reps that are helping lead the legislative fight to ensure that we have common sense gun safety legislation. So to share briefly about the work of NextGen and how this um, effort intersects with our work. So NextGen America is the country's largest youth voting rights organization each election, we help mobilize and reach millions of young people to make sure that their voices are heard on the issues that matter to them most. And in our 10 year history, we have seen a surge of young people engaged in fighting for common gun safety solutions. And we know, and we at NextGen believe that while we have some great politicians, we put our hope primarily in America's young people to drive and make change. And that the change that has been won on this issue is because young people have been organizing, mobilizing, and voting in record numbers to make elected officials accountable and make sure the NRA doesn't have the same representation that America's young people have on this issue. Um, and so I'll share more um, uh, about our work and how we build the political power of young people to make sure that we tackle this epidemic for young people um, across the country. Thank you so much, Christina. So next up, we have Natalie Fall, and Natalie is the Executive Director of March for Our Lives. And Natalie's been with March for Our Lives since 2019 and stepped in into her role as Executive Director last year. Before joining March for Our Lives, she was at Giffords, another organization dedicated to saving lives from gun violence and the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence. Take it away, Natalie. Thank you so much, Angela, and thanks. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, thank you to all the folks here to listen to this important conversation. Um, as Angela said, my name is Natalie Fall, and I'm the executive director of March for Our Lives. Uh, March for Our Lives, founded after the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida in 2018, um, is one of the, the largest youth-led movements in the country today. And since leading one of the largest youth protests in American history back in 2018, We've gone on to organize young people across the country in their high schools, on college campuses, and just in our communities to support and help prepare young people to step into leadership roles in this fight for our lives. By giving young folks the mic, by centering their lived experience with the crisis of gun violence, and by supporting their growth as experts and change makers, we're helping to build an entire generation of youth leaders who won't hold back, who are willing to shake up the status quo and make bold, uncompromising demands to fight for our right to live free of gun violence. Through our organizing, we've seen, for one thing, a total transformation in how gun violence is talked about in this country. And everyone on this call has played an important role in that, and I think we'll probably talk more about that later. But in recent years, we've seen a complete inversion in public opinion, especially among young people, on the issue of gun safety. 
Gun safety is no longer the boogeyman that politicians are unwilling to touch. Instead, gun safety is an essential policy platform, particularly in the eyes of young voters. It's a political liability not to address it. We see that, clear, we see that clearly in poll after poll and in election outcomes. And two, we've seen a surge in youth activism and whole swaths of Gen Z and millennials marking the March for, their, for Our Lives in 2018 as their entry point into civic engagement and our political system. And they saw themselves through that as agents of change. Here's this intractable issue, something that feels impossible to tackle, but I see myself as a piece of the puzzle. That's what we seek to provide for young folks in this country. That's had a rever reverberating impact on our democracy and on the conversation of gun safety, and it's led to incredible surges in youth voter turnout. It's made the different difference in elections across the country. We're so proud, we're so lucky to work with young people all over the country with March for Our Lives who are shaping the national conversation and forcing change to happen in a way that would have been unthinkable just a few years ago. Again, I'm so grateful to be here with y'all for this conversation and can't wait to get into it. Natalie, thank you so much for being here today. So we're honored to have Congresswoman Veronica Escobar of Texas join us. And Representative Escobar is a third generation El Pasoan who has dedicated herself to serving the people of El Paso and America. During her time in Congress, Representative Escobar fought for LGBTQ rights, equal pay, gun safety, environmental protections, expanding health care for all Americans and election security. I mean, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> she's also the sponsor of the Disarm Hate Act and is here to tell us more about why this election is so critically important. Congresswoman Escobar, over to you. Angela, thank you so much for your introduction. And I, I want to say thank you to all the speakers for being such inspirational leaders and for continuing to work together, collaborate on this really critical issue, this monumental challenge that our country faces. But I really, I also wanna thank everyone who's participating in this webinar. Thank you for your commitment to creating safer communities. Thank you for working toward what is right. And I wanna tell everyone that your work makes a huge difference. I remember when I was first running for Congress uh, in 2018, the, the conversations just over the last few years have really be begun shifting and changing and more and more legislators are basically understanding what's at stake because of the work that's being done at the grassroots level. Um, in my community, I can tell you, we saw a, a significant shift after the August 3rd, 2019 horrific shooting uh, at an El Paso Walmart. We had a white supremacist who drove over 10 hours from East Texas coming to our community, fueled by incredible hate, and in the possession of uh, weapons of war and 23 innocent lives were taken on that day and dozens of members of my community were injured. Many of the survivors still have to live with surgeries. They, they continue physical therapy, they live in pain. And I can tell you having lived through that with my community, there, we have an entire community demanding action now. And I don't know that that was necessarily the case, but when all, when when violence comes into your community, when you see the impact of what happens with the number of guns in our country, that spurs people into action. And it's really been the voices of young people across the country who've had to endure uh, learning how to deal with potential gun violence in their classrooms or seeing what's happened to their generation, young people in their generation. It's your work that it has been so transformative. So I wanna thank you all. I am so proud of the Disarm Hate Bill that I hope gets signed into law at some point very soon. Um, and, and I believe that it will with the uh, action, inspiration and effort by all of you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate being a part of the conversation. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you so much for being here today and for your critical work on behalf of Texans and communities across this country. So our next speaker is Congressman Stephen Horsford of Nevada. And I'm so proud to say Every Town for Gun Safety and Mom Demand Action's 2023 Federal Gun Sense Lawmaker of the Year for his leadership on gun violence prevention. 
While in Congress, Representative Horsford has focused on ending the school to prison pipeline and providing the safety net the children and families need to succeed. He's worked to strengthen children, families, and communities because these are priorities for so many Nevadans. He also fights for responsible gun safety policies, including background checks. He's also a gun violence survivor himself, having lost his father when he was 19 and empathizes with those who have experienced the pain of a loved one taken by gun violence. Congressman Horsford is the architect of the Break the Cycle of Violence Act and is here to tell us more about how this legislation works to support gun violence prevention efforts, not only in Nevada, but across the country. Representative Horsford, thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Angela. Uh, it's great to be with you, uh, with members of every town, March for Our Lives and Next Gen America uh, for this very important conversation on gun violence prevention. And really just wanna start by commending all of you. It's, it's also great to be here with my friend and colleague, Congresswoman Veronica Escobar and her tremendous work and leadership on, on these and other uh, important issues. Uh, in 2022, the House passed my Break the Cycle of Violence Act, which was actually on the 30th anniversary of uh, the, the day my father died from gun violence. Uh, while the Senate didn't pass the bill that Congress, a part of my bill was included in the Bipartisan Safer Communities Law, uh, and that did become law. And you all made that happen the first time in nearly 30 years. We know uh, and now have the most federal investment for community violence intervention programs, uh, thanks to this law. But we know that it's not enough uh, and that more work needs to be done to reduce crime, to save lives and to break the cycle of violence. Because we also know that crime and violence don't happen in a vacuum. It happens when people lose hope and don't see opportunities in their own lives or readily available in the communities uh, that they live. Uh, I know that uh, firsthand um, because as Angela said, uh, my father was shot and killed when I was 19 years old. I was a freshman in college. Uh, he was working at a local convenience store as a cook um, and because of Census gun violence, uh, he died in an ambulance uh, on the way to the hospital. I never had the opportunity to say goodbye, to tell him that I loved him, or for him to see uh, his son finish school, uh, start a family, raise three kids, uh, serve my community, and now represent um, the district that I grew up in in Congress. And in fact, my father died a block away from where I grew up, um, a block away from where I uh, led the largest job training program in Nevada and um, in the heart of the district that I represent. So this is more, um, let me just say, this is not about politics for me, uh, it's personal. And it's about what we collectively can do uh, to hold everyone accountable to do their job to keep our community safe. We need to focus on preventing crime before it ever starts. And that is exactly what uh, my Break the Cycle of Violence Act, HR 5003, will do. The bill invests $5 billion in anti-violence programs and $1.5 billion to provide workforce training and job opportunities for opportunity youth, youth with a lot of potential and a lot of purpose, ages 16 to 24. This money invests in proven community-based violence intervention programs to build safer communities. This is about saving lives and preventing crime, and our constituents are also counting on us to get this done. This historic legislation uh, that will reduce crime and break the cycle of violence uh, that so many people throughout the country have unfortunately experienced. You all know the statistics. Every day, 110 uh, Americans um, are killed by guns, and over 200 are shot and wounded. Sadly, not all those um, people are uh, talked about on uh, the local news. Today, gun violence remains the leading cause of premature death for Black men, as well as the number two cause of premature death 
for Latino men and black women. That's why I'm so pleased that the White House has recognized the need to launch and start the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. You all made that happen. They're coordinating events around the country and connecting with communities that are most impacted to make sure that they are connected to the resources that we passed from the bipartisan Safer Communities Law um, by tracking and pr promoting the implementation of that law. Thanks to that office and all of your hard work and the leadership from the Biden-Harris administration, so far, that law has issued a final rule that ensures fewer guns will be sold without background checks. Historic investments in student mental health for states and school districts, including a billion dollars to hire and train more than 14,000 school mental health professionals. More than 750 prohibited individuals have been denied firearms uh, because of the work that you all made happen, particularly um, for individuals under 21 years of age. And more than 430 gun traffickers charged under the bill expanded federal enforcement efforts to crack down on gun trafficking. And finally, it launched the first ever National Extreme Risk Protection Order Resource Center, which supports the effective implementation of state red flag law. So there's still so much more work to be done. I know that with all of you, with young people at the forefront, um, we will make this change. When I lost my father, um, I could have gone in a lot of different directions, but that pain was turned into purpose. That purpose has led to legislation and policy, but it's always been centered on the people who matter the most. And that's what you all are about today. It's about centering the people in the policy to affect change in our community. And I wanna commend all of you for doing that every single day. And, and I count myself among the partners uh, in this fight with you. So thank you for having me today. Thank you so much, Representative Horsford. You are such a courageous and inspirational leader. Thank you for sharing about your father. We are incredibly proud of you as I can only imagine he would be. Uh, and thank you again to Representative Escobar and Christina Titsun Ramirez and Natalie Fall for being here with us today and for this important conversation. So I have a series of questions that I'd like to present to you all for your thoughts and consideration. And I really wanna start with Representative Horsford I know that you need to jump off soon and we're so grateful uh, to you for being here with us. So I wanna start with you. Um, we, we know we need immediate and lasting gun safety legislation and to truly heal from this public health crisis, we also have to address the root causes of community violence. Congressman Horsford, can you discuss the types of promising evidence-informed community violence intervention and prevention programs that your Break the Cycle Violence Act would invest in? You talked a little bit about it, but can you go a little bit more? Well, first, I believe that the best uh, replacement for a bullet is an opportunity. And for young people, that's education, that's job training, that's a job. For some, it could be uh, starting a business and starting as entrepreneurs. And that's why there's a balance between investing in community violence intervention, as well as investing in the types of opportunities for young people in their communities so that they, uh, again, never even get caught up in uh, the gun culture. But drilling down even further, the Break the Cycle of Violence Bill would invest in hospital-based violence interruption programs in order to reach su survivors of violence in the hospital. This actually helps reduce um, retribution and retaliation. Uh, some programs do involve police. Group violence intervention are collaborations among community leaders, social service providers, and law enforcement. And so figuring out how to build that trust with the community and law enforcement is a big part of this. Uh, group violence intervention don't rely on more police. At their best, they re-engineer how police departments can operate and operate more effectively within the community. And finally, more common sense approaches that are center that center community and that center people, that employ violence interrupters or neighborhood change agents, the people who actually have been affected by gun violence, who can be trained as pro professionals to deal with the response uh, in our community. 
That's what the bill, Break the Cycle of Violence, uh, can achieve. And with all of your support, I know we're going to get it over the finish line. We've already got $250 million in the Bipartisan Safer Communities Law. That's the largest federal investment. This bill would provide $6.5 billion over eight years, and that would really transform our communities effectively. Thank you so much. So much incredible progress, so much to be done, but want to take a moment to really celebrate what we've already been able to do together. Uh, Representative Escobar, so you've championed the disarmed hate bill, which would prohibit people convicted of misdemeanor hate crimes from possessing or purchasing guns, which is closing a loophole in our background check system. Can you tell us more about why and how we need to address the intersection of racism and generally hate in our gun violence crisis? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think I think what's important for all of us to recognize is there's no way we will ever prevent all violence all the time, right? But because we have not had enough support in Congress and in state legislatures to really clamp down on the vast proliferation of guns all across America. In fact, getting to a point where there are more guns than people in America, we've got to find ways that are common sense that tackle patterns that we have seen. And unfortunately, what we have seen in our country is a pattern of people who are motivated by hate, who also have easy access to guns, who then use those guns to carry out their hateful acts. And it ends up with violence and um, death and bloodshed. So the, the bill, which was originally written and sponsored by a dear, dear friend of mine, who is no longer in Congress, David Cicilline from Rhode Island, um, he and I talked a lot about it. We, we served on the House Judiciary Committee together. I'm still on that committee. And when he left, left Congress, because um, he and I had spent so much time working on this, uh, I then carried it this Congress. So I want to give credit where credit is due to our beloved David Cicilline. But, you know, the the talk about a, a, a tragic commentary because there have been so many hate crimes in this country committed with guns. There are there were a number of original co-sponsors to this bill, um, members of Congress who've had that hate inflicted upon their community with uh, with um, um, a gun, just as I described what happened in El Paso on August 3rd. And so while we can't ever completely prevent these hate crimes um, that are executed with guns, what we can do is try to target people who who have demonstrated that they have committed violent, uh, they have committed hate crimes in the past, and make sure that they never have access to a gun. And you know, so when you think about, for example, people who've been convicted of of misdemeanor crimes that are related to hate crimes. The, the goal is to make sure that there's never a situation that presents itself with someone who has already exhibited the pattern and practice of, of committing a hate crime, albeit a misdemeanor level, making sure they, they cannot inflict that harm on communities of color or vulnerable populations uh, with a weapon or a weapon of war. So until we can get to a point where we are, you know, banning the use, for example, um, you know, of AR-15s and, you know, the, the sale, the use, the production, et cetera, you know, of, of these type of weapons of war, or until we can finally achieve some real meaningful common sense gun violence prevention legislation, we need, we need to try to target it where we can to save lives and prevent the kind of tragedy that Stevens lived through, that I've lived through, that probably each and every one of us on this webinar has lived through. And, and tackling that together in order to try to save those lives until we get to that point where we have large enough majorities to, to create even more sweeping legislation, we believe that this is um, an appropriate approach uh, until we can get there. Thank you so much, Representative Escobar. I really appreciate that.
So this next question is for all of you. Um, how do you see the issue of gun violence showing up in folks' everyday lives? Natalie, I want to start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as someone uh, in my role, I, I work day in and day out with um, young folks and and hear from them about their perspectives and their lived experience with uh, school shooter drills, um, with um, in many cases um, facing or surviving violence themselves. Um, I think it's very um, it's very apparent that we have a whole generation of young folks who are traumatized by this issue and who live in constant fear of. Um, you know, facing gun violence in their their daily lives. Um, so I think that you know the the mental health toll that that takes on a generation and on an entire country really um, is is sort of hard to put into words, um, but is something that you know hangs heavily over us and the work that we do every single day. And so I think that's what what comes to mind first when you ask the question is just you know the the mental health toll and the trauma that that young folks face is is really concerning and something that we we just have to handle with urgency. Thank you so much for lifting that up. So important. Anyone else want to jump in? Christina, anyone else to answer that question? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, you know, I think it's so great to have incredible congressional representatives that are taking these issues from their communities, from their own lived experience to tackle it. And also that there is a movement, I think, happening. It can feel overwhelming. You know, I graduated high school the year of the Columbine shooting, and I've spent my entire adult life waiting for Congress to take very basic actions that the majority of the American public support. And instead we decided to teach a generation of children to learn how to play dead in their classrooms. Like that was the policy solution by many elected officials, which was no solution. And so the trauma is very real, right? We know that um, mass shootings is one form of gun violence, that there is also interpersonal gun violence. There's also hugely ri uh, rising rates of suicide, um, especially with young people as we face a, a mental health crisis. And so um, it is a lot for young people to be absorbing this level of violence and also the lack of action over the last 20 plus years that this has really, really ballooned as an epidemic across our country. But the movement that we have seen are because people that are survivors are saying we refuse to accept this reality as the status quo. We refuse to accept the idea that our children are not safe in their own schools and their own communities, um, that uh, parents cannot feel safe, right? My son's seven and every year they practice, right? And I'm aware that we are actually traumatizing children. It doesn't do anything to keep my child safer. And I live in Texas, like Representative Veronica Escobar, that the state with the most guns has the most mass shootings. Who would have thought, right? And so it's very clear we know what the policy solutions are. And I, I think we have to just remind ourselves in this moment, what is winning? Are people organizing and fighting the special interests of the NRA and saying, we will fight and elect officials like the ones we have here today that actually want to represent people that actually want to represent young people. And so just for folks that are listening, especially young people, y'all are the largest voting bloc in the entire country. This is your top issue. You got to go vote this election um, because this is what happens when you elect really good people that actually care about real people. Thank you so much, Christina. So many good points that you've lifted up and we're going to go and jump ahead to the election in a moment. But I want to, you know, you mentioned, and so did Natalie as well, like the toll that this has taken, and particularly on young people. Um, but I also like to think about solutions and, and ways that we can learn as a movement. So what can we learn from young leaders that will inform us to make us more effective in our actions? And this is to everybody, but it's kind of a follow-up to what I'm hearing from you, Christina and Natalie. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> um, I think I would say, what, what can we learn from the young folks um, that we work with and who are really stepping into leadership in this movement? Um, to uh, For me, it's um, to not accept no as an answer um, and to not back down and to not believe when you are told that something is not possible. If we believed that at March for Our Lives, for example, when we got started, You'd never think the NRA would be in the weakened position that they are today. You'd never, we we asked and we were told no over years about the White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention, right up until the moment it was possible. And then we got to watch, you know, my former colleague, um, Representative Maxwell Frost, introduce the president, the president credit young people marching for their lives with 
um, you know, adopting that office. So these are just a couple examples. It, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act is another, you, you know, if you're told constantly you'll never get anything done in Congress, and then you do. And so I think that that is what um, stands out to me, what I um, try to embody as I work with the young folks I do, that it's just, you know, we cannot accept the status quo. We cannot ex accept no, because it, it is literally life and death um, in this case. So I think that's what I would say. Thank you so much. Anyone else want to jump in before I move to the next question? Well, Christina, I do have a question for you. I really want to know, um, you spoke a little about this, but want to go a little deeper. How does this issue show up for young folks on college campuses? And what are some of the overarching sentiments that we hear from young voters when it comes to gun violence prevention? Yeah, I, I think so our organization organizes around all kinds of issues that young people care about. And whenever there is sadly a mass shooting, we see a huge surge. The hope that I do have is that we see a huge surge of young people sign up that say they want to take action, that register to vote, that pledge to vote, that commit to volunteer, to turn out other people to vote, That uh, uh, and that's due from organizations also like Natalie's March for Our Lives. It was started by young people that did refuse to to say no. I think we are seeing there's so much power in the youth vote right now across the country. Um, young people are voting at the largest numbers in, in American history. Um, in 2020 was the largest youth voter turnout that our country has ever seen. And so as young people turn out and most of them do not like going to schools where they're traumatized and taught uh, that they can't be safe in schools. So then you talk about college campuses and um, what we've seen as the political power of young people grows, that people are also attacking that. So uh, I live in Texas where last legislative session, our brilliant legislative legislators proposed a bill, Republican legislators proposed a bill that would have barred polling locations from college campuses across our state, which, which would have disenfranchised 1.5 million students. And they said it was due in part um, for safety. Um, safety reasons, right? These are the same legislators that have allowed for open carry, concealed carry, like the same people that have allowed, that actually um, support people carrying guns at schools, say it's for our own safety that they don't want us to vote. So what is more dangerous, the ballot or the bullet, right? For those folks, obviously the ballot for them is more dangerous than keeping us and young people safe. But that has actually become a huge mobilization tool for young people that recognize the contradiction and uh, and the lie of, of what's actually being kept safe, of what actually is dangerous, was dangerous is taking away their political power when they're not serving the interests of America's young people. So young people are smart, they've caught on, they know that it's a lie and they're organizing and voting and turning out like never before. That's amazing to hear. Thank you. As a mother of four, my two oldest will be 23 this year. They voted for the first time in 2020. A lot of what you say really resonates for me. And so thank you so much. And I love lifting up the intersection of not just the issue of gun violence, but we have to look at voting rights and all of its civic engagement and making sure uh, that folks can show up. Uh, so this one is for the entire group. So jump in. Uh, calls for addressing the root causes of gun violence often come as a way to avoid pushing for immediate and lasting gun safety policies. And addressing root causes is necessary. So what strategies are you seeing from a policy perspective and a movement perspective that are effectively addressing the need for both? You know, I, I, I'd like to jump in and I mean, I want to say just Christina and Natalie are such great voices on this issue. Thank you all for everything that you are doing. You're so impressive and inspiring. But you know, that when we passed, when Congress passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, that was a there was a lot of conversation around that, around root causes. And there was a lot of debunking of myths that many of us had to um, offer and a lot of work that we did. Because frequently the other side, the side that fights common sense gun violence prevention legislation, they frequently want to immediately point to mental illness, for example, and say, well, you know, the reason that America has a gun violence epidemic is mental illness. Somehow trying to rationalize that the U.S. suffers from more severe mental illness than any other industrialized country in the world. When we know that's not the case, and in fact, it is the number of guns 
that has created this epidemic and the easy access to guns. So when we were talking through and debating the Bipartisan uh, Safer Communities Act, which was a very important first step, but for many of us, like me, did not nearly go far enough. But, you know, was I going to walk away from an opportunity to take a step forward? Absolutely not. And when, when the Senate decided to invest significantly in, um, you know, mental health tools and provide funding with regard to mental health, my view was it's already underfunded, so we welcome the added funding that will go to help uh, address mental illness in this country. Even though, mind you, it doesn't it doesn't offer enough resources. Um, so it was a step forward, you, you know, in that respect. And but but I do think always, 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 we've got to bring the conversation back to the actual guns. And so now that we have focused on policy that passed in a bipartisan way out of the Senate, out of the House, and was signed by the president, we really now have to focus on what comes next, which is the guns themselves. And again, like an assault uh, assault weapon ban um, and uh, robust background checks, closing loopholes, disarming hate, all of those things that we've talked about in this conversation, all of that has to happen in addition to the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which sought to address some root causes. I, I do think it is so important, just to put a finer point on something Christina said about young people being a significant voting block. You know, the the this year is an important election year. Every year is important, but this year there will be a determination made from the president and the White House all the way down to school districts in the in communities and everything in between. It is so important, especially for the generation that has been most profoundly impacted by gun violence, that they vote, that you all vote with your priorities in mind, everything up and down the ballot. You know, I, I can tell you, you know, that there's, a, you know, conversations on cable news all the time about the youth vote and young people not feeling inspired to turn out. This issue, I think, and this election this year, really critical to the movement. And I, I think it's really important that everyone understand the power that they have at the ballot box. Thank you so much, Representative Escobar. You're jumping into what I was gonna ask them next, which is really important. Uh, thinking about voting, like the power elections have consequences, they matter. All the things we're talking about um, are impacted by elections and who is in office. And I want to just throw this out to anyone that wants to to answer that go a little bit deeper is what do you say when folks are uh, feeling like a little bit helpless and hopeless, when it feels like so much is at stake and it almost brings on an inertia with people or even feeling like nothing is changing or your vote doesn't matter. I have to, again, I have two older kids and my daughter is really easy uh, to get out the door and she's already ready. But my son, I have to sit down and really talk through because he's sometimes stuck in a place of not, where do I see this change? So what would you say to young people that feel, they hear what we're saying, but they don't really quite understand fully what is it, why does it matter? What is this connection? Why does my vote matter? And you said a little, Representative Escobar, but I'd love our folks to jump in and, and say a little bit more about this to inspire our young folks. Um, for me, I think it's really important since I get the opportunity to lead the country's largest youth vote organization is to understand that voting isn't the only way you change the world. Um, it isn't the only thing you should do, but it is the most basic thing you can do, right? There is, this is not only when I say this is the most civically engaged generation in American history, I don't mean just they're showing up and voting. Now they are showing up and voting in record numbers, but that isn't where civic engagement ends. A civic engagement also includes going to protests. So um, uh, we know that um, millions of young people participated in Black Lives Matter uh, movement. That is a form of civic engagement. Um, we know that um, young people are turning out and talking to their friends. And like when they post something on social media or they tell their own story or their own opinion, that is also a form of civic engagement. So for me, 
um, you don't just, if you, the most basic thing you should do is vote because that is an incredible tool that's powerful, but it isn't, again, the only thing you can do and nor should it be. Um, but I think understandably young people get upset when they say, oh, all, the only thing you need to do to just change the world is vote. No, it's not the only thing you need to do, but people are counting on you to count yourself out in your own power and not vote. And that's how people have won, like the NRA, they've at, you know, it's the cyclical problem. Young people don't turn out to vote, they say. So people don't invest in them and they don't represent their issues. Look where young people are winning. When I think about the issues this moment that this administration and um, the top issues that surge in our country, student debt cancellation, um, climate legislation, the fact that there is now an office of gun safety um, pre and prevention is because young people have organized and voted. So, so oftentimes we are not uh, always thinking about when we're winning and how far we're getting. You don't win what you want overnight. And if you don't like, if you feel like we've won some things, but not enough, good, because we haven't won enough. So keep voting, keep turning out and realize that celebrate the gains and then get angry at how, at the victories that we have yet to achieve and win. Christina, that couldn't have been stated better. Really excited about that. And also, if you don't like your choices, then you can throw your hat in yourself. That is something we see with Representative Maxwell Frost and others. Doesn't matter. Young leaders are showing up in so many ways. So thank you for uh, to lifting that. So this has been such an important conversation. And I thank you all again for being here today. Um, the final question that I have for the group is what gives you hope when it comes to affecting real lasting change in the fight against gun violence in this country? Women like you and young people like those participating in this webinar. Love that, thank you. Anything else? Yeah, I think I'll just add um, that the, the commitment, the resolve that I see day in and day out from young folks who could be doing a whole lot of other things with their time and they're choosing to do this work um, to make our community safer, that is what gives me hope, keeps me going. Great. Any last thoughts? I, Wonderful. I just, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, know, I was just going to say, I think we actually have a lot to be hopeful for, right? Even though this is a very um, hard, hurtful topic, right? This isn't a topic that brings people joy. Um, but I think that the movement and the work of people refusing to give up hope, that brings me a lot of joy. That brings me, like, I think oftentimes out of pain and tragedy, um, there are beautiful relationships that are developed. People are organizing and coming together and building something that's a lot of really beautiful in the place of something that is so tragic. Um, and even um, listening to the congressman's story, you know, now we all feel like, I think a sense of, wow, your dad would have been so proud of you. And to know that you use that tragedy to then go achieve, try and achieve change for so many other people. Um, that brings me a lot of hope. And the only thing in my mind that ever changes history is people organizing and fighting everyday ordinary people with all the odds against them. And this is a story that I do think we will triumph overall in the long term as a country. We will look back and say, remember when the gun industry and a few very prosperous companies tried to have their hold on our country and our young people and young people and communities came together and organized and, and put that industry and how it shaped all of our public policies to rest and changed American history. So I, I do believe we're in we're on that course, even if we can't see the end yet. Christina, as an organizer, that's music to my ears and so inspirational. Uh, joy is such an imperative if we want to sustain this movement and this work and also just build the country and the future that we know that we deserve. So thank you all again so much for taking the time to join us today. I know that this topic can be a heavy one, but I hope that you're able to find a little joy and hope in this work as Christina highlighted, because without it, this movement is unsustainable. I can't say enough how critical it is that we all continue to center young leaders in this movement. You have so much knowledge and power when it comes to making progress on gun safety. And if you're interested in getting involved with Students in Man Action, you can text students to 64433 to find out how young people are organizing in your community. I also wanna remind young people, even though you might be tired of hearing it, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, how critical it is to wield that power at the polls this November. 
with the NRA in a free fall, our movement is stronger than ever before. And the Biden-Harris administration leading with a gun safety from the White House, leading with gun safety from the White House. It's so impactful and the solutions are really within reach. So voting is not just an easy answer. It's an essential tool to influence change. And I know I don't have to tell you how much we have at stake this election. And as Christina said, it's not, it's just the beginning. It's not the end. It's the beginning and a basic tool that we can use. So thank you all again for joining us. Have a great rest of your afternoon, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you.